Hola, muy buenas tardes a todos y muy buenos días a nuestros invitados. Les, les damos la bienvenida a esta tercera jornada de este ciclo de conferencias internacionales organizado por la Comisión de Endoscopía Flexible de la Asociación Argentina de Cirugía. En el día de hoy las conferencias serán sobre resecciones endoscópicas eh, de colon y aprenderemos de los expertos. Eh, contaremos para este seminario web con eh, dos eh, destacados referentes internacionales en el tema, el profesor Michael Berg y el profesor Yotaka Saito, a quienes agradecemos infinitamente su participación, el compartir con nosotros sus experiencias y sobre todo su tiempo, que es valiosísimo, así que muchísimas gracias a ambos. Eh, con respecto a la modalidad de este seminario, eh, vamos a escuchar ambas conferencias y al finalizar las mismas eh, podremos eh, realizar algunas pocas preguntas del público asistente, ya que ambos expositores se deben eh, retirar para continuar con sus actividades habituales, y van a coordinar el seminario de hoy el doctor Emiliano Maranesi y el doctor Gonzalo Castellano Egloff, ambos integrantes de la Comisión de Endoscopía de nuestra asociación. En primer lugar escucharemos la conferencia del profesor Michael Burke, que será sobre resección endoscópica eh, de lesiones específicas en pólipos colorectales grandes, no pediculados, mucosectomía, disección submucosa y el resto. El doctor Berg es por todos conocido, es una autoridad internacional de renombre mundial en la endoscopía digestiva, eh, es médico gastroenterólogo y endoscopista intervencionista avanzado, es profesor de la Universidad de Sydney y es eh, director de endoscopía gastrointestinal en el Hospital eh, Westmead, en Sydney, Australia. Además cuenta con una vasta e importantísima actividad académica. Doctor Berg, muchísimas gracias por estar con nosotros, y adelante con su presentación. Uh, thank you, Sandra. Thank you uh, to the Argentinian Society for the honor of giving this lecture. Um, Uh, so, just get started here. So, okay. Um, so that's my my um, disclosures. So I'm going to talk about uh, background uh, lesion specific considerations. Um, I'm going to talk about EMR and ESD, and then this new area of the rectum specific um, resection algorithm. So there are two uh, very excellent guidelines on the endoscopic management of uh, colorectal lesions recently published, the European guideline, which I was fortunate to chair in 2017, and the American guideline, uh, which was just published uh, in gastroenterology and also GIE last year. And they're, they're almost the same, almost identical. Um, from the European guideline, we have this idea of the lesion specific treatment algorithm. And uh, you can see that the approach very much depends on lesion size and predicted histology. And then the thing that's missing from both guidelines is this idea about what about the right versus the left, the right side of the colon versus the left. So when we look at a lesion in the colon and we make a decision about how to manage it, we're always considering these things. Is it adenomatous or a serrated lesion? Is it benign, clearly benign, or is there possible um, submucosal invasive cancer, which can be considered as overt, you can see it, or possibly covert, can't be seen, but it's a risk factor because of the morphology of the lesion. And then the approach very much depends on the size of the lesion. Uh, and finally, the location. When we remove lesions from the colon, our goals are very simply these. We need to safely, precisely, efficiently, and completely resect the target tissue for cure. We want to minimize invasiveness and avoid patient injury, avoid recurrence. We want to avoid unnecessary expense, time expenditure, or opportunity costs. So it's really not appropriate to spend a lot of time trying to remove a lesion with a more complex technique when a simpler, uh, more direct technique will be equally as effective. And finally, we want to avoid surgery, which is uh, with its associated morbidity. So we need to make the best evidence-based medicine therapeutic decision for the patient. Um, not the health and the healthcare system, not the doctor or the, the, the doctor's ego. Uh, finally, the only person who gets hurt when we make a bad decision is the patient, not the doctor. Um, so lesion assessment is critical. This starts with overview and then finally uh, 
moving to focal interrogation, evaluating pit pattern and microvasculature. And basically, even if you don't know the pit pattern or uh, vascular pattern classifications, what you're really looking for is lesion homogeneity. When you look at a lesion, it's a benign lesion should be homogeneous. You should be able to put this on your lounge room wall at home as the wallpaper. Some of your friends might think you're a little extreme, although in Latin America, I understand there are variations on, on fashion and so forth. So this could probably be quite acceptable in the Latin American um, household on the wall in the lounge room. So, but what you see is a, a repetitive pattern and it's homogeneous. So when you see this loss of homogeneity, so we see a regular pattern here and then this demarcated zone. So we look for a demarcation line, a demarcated zone, then something else is going on here. This is obviously cancer. It's best seen with the advanced imaging of narrowband, narrowband imaging or BLI or whichever platform. These are three separate lesions that were referred to our center for endoscopic resection. But even in overview, you see that there's an area of concern in each of them. Um, and then when we look more carefully, we see this disruption to the background uh, pit pattern, vascular pattern, and finally up close with MBI, you can see loss of homogeneity, a demarcated area. This is clearly cancer. Um, also, don't forget about large serrated lesions and particularly in the right colon. Um, if you see a small adenoma in the right colon like this guy, just check carefully that there's not surrounding uh, serrated tissue because this could be a serrated lesion with dysplasia. In other words, a lesion that could be rapidly progressive heading towards cancer. Um, so now in 2020, the standard of care for resection in the colon, the basic method for most polyps, because 90% of polyps are less than 10 millimeter, is cold snare resection. And so all adenomas need to be managed by cold snare resection. And you can see that this is a perfect match for all of these lesions. This works well. And in fact, even for larger lesions, this works well. We're doing a randomized trial in this subgroup and cold snare works very well. There's no risk with cold snare. There's no risk of bleeding. Um, there's no risk of perforation. So it's very effective. Maybe recurrence is higher. It doesn't work for chunky lesions because you can't really chop into that. Um, uh, of course, if we're concerned, uh, you know, bulky 1S lesions, then we can excise them by EMR. And I'll come back to that in a minute. If we're worried we've made a deep injury, we can clip that up. We also have this, this idea that now we can do controlled, intentional, full thickness on block excision for early cancer. These are some examples. Uh, so we deliberately make a big excision by EMR. Um, it's much more controlled than the endoscopic full thickness resection device. And then we can close that up with clips quite deliberately taking the muscle layer here. That works for small cancers, 20 millimeter and less. So what about these uh, flat lesions, 10 to 19 millimeters? So the guideline says hot or cold snare polypectomy. Um, we're doing a randomized trial of cold versus hot. So here's an example. This is a larger lesion. Um, so in Japan, definitely they do this by ESD, but we can do it by EMR. It'll take about five or 10 minutes uh, now that we've got pretty good at it. And patient goes home like, you know, can hop out of the bed and walk home, to be honest. Um, uh, and then fully, fully resected lesion there. Um, once you get the hang of it, you can do it very quickly. Um, what about serrated lesions? Well, these are perfect targets for cold snare excision. Um, except for uh, the serrated lesion with dysplasia, I think that needs to be done by EMR. We want to take the big dysplastic focus in one piece. And of course, uh, serrated pathway cancers can't be managed that way. We've published that cold EMR for large serrated lesions works well. We, we had these two retrospective series, one from Brisbane and the other from our centre, maybe 200 patients. And then recently we published this paper in GUT last year comparing um, the, the piecemeal cold snare resection to three or 400 uh, hot snare excisions. And you can see that complication rates were very, very low with the cold snare excision, in fact, zero, but did occur deep mural injury, target sign, et cetera, bleeding 5%, et cetera. Um, this is the, the, the flow diagram from the study, lots of data there. Uh, but finally, it works very, very well um, 
And when in doubt, you just keep extending the resection defect like so. You use the water jet to expand the defect. It gives you a firm um, a cushion to work on with your, your dedicated uh, cold snare, which is stiff, uh, thin wire, uh, 0.3 millimeter diameter um, wire. And you can, if you're in doubt, you just keep excising. Um, this is the recurrence rate. You can see at first surveillance, um, sorry, his recurrence, first surveillance was, um, uh, recurrence was 3% versus five. And then at second surveillance at 18 months, recurrence is the same, cold versus hot. So, um, uh, so there's a little bit of recurrence, but the technique is very effective. This is how it looks. This is a lesion which is um, uh, almost fully circumferential serrated lesion excised by cold snare. Um, if we did that by EMR or ESD, ESD is going to take hours. Uh, EMR takes, you know, an hour or two. Um, and then you see here the follow-up. Um, we're worried this might be a recurrence. In fact, it's not. But nonetheless, even though it's occurring within the scar, using a dedicated cold snare, we can excise that area and we can keep going, make a large resection. Um, and ensure that uh, if there is anything uh, behind there that we've removed it all. Um, the key thing with the cold snare resection, just watch my hand here on the left, you really have to push down very, very firmly with the up down wheel. So you anchor the snare on the mucosa. It's, it's the opposite of hot snare excision. Anchor down firmly and then close slowly, uh, capture as much tissue as you want. So coming to EMR, of course, this is now accepted as the standard of care for large colonic lesions uh, throughout the Western world. Um, and the performance characteristics are summarized here. It performs very well. Um, all of these problems that previously existed have been sorted. It's very fast, inexpensive, same day discharge. Bleeding occurs in the right colon, but clipping up the defect stops that, reduces the risk to around 3%. Perforation doesn't occur. If it does, we recognize it intraprocedurally and close that up. And then recurrence, of course, we've worked out how to avoid that. So you're just left with the issue about cancer. So talking about perforation, we have this classification system, uh, which was published in GUT in 2016 or 17. Um, you look at the post-EMR defect and you can determine whether there's a risk for delayed perforation. So these are all target signs, holes in the muscularis propria. You of course have to recognize this. So after each resection, we look carefully. If we see uh, loss of homogeneity, the bland blue uh, post EMR defect, then we consider there might be an injury to the muscle layer. We can stain it with the blue dye. And if we need to, we clip it up. Um, so it used to be that this, this uh, target sign was, was the black hole of endoscopy. Uh, but now we recognize that uh, the reality is that this can all be managed preemptively. If you have concerns, just close the defect with through the scope clips, very efficient, safe, effective. Um, so as I said, EMR is the standard of care. And the additional thing now is thermal ablation of the post EMR margin. Um, so we showed that in a randomized trial published in gastroenterology um, two years ago, that if we uh, treat the post EMR margin with thermal ablation using snare tip soft coagulation. This reduces the risk of recurrence from around 20% at six months down to 5%. That's in a setting of a randomized trial, four centers, 420 patients. And indeed it, it occurred while we're still sort of learning the technique somewhat. So if you look at this example here, I used to always show this slide as a slide demonstrating optimal um, thermal ablation of the post EMR margin. But in hindsight now in 2020 and 2021, I look back and I see, look, we didn't really treat that area there, nor did we treat that area there. And this is why there was some recurrence because we're still learning how safe thermal ablation of the post EMR margin was. The recurrence comes from the edge. No doubt it comes from the edge. So um, now we're much more aggressive. And um, this, uh, I, I'm not sure if I have the paper here, um, but uh, this study is just um, uh, 
online in gastroenterology in 2021. Uh, it was accepted a few months ago. 1,600 cases, uh, international multi-center study, I think 13 endoscopists um, enrolling between 50 and up to 200 uh, cases each. And recurrence was 1.2 or 1.3%. So in my own experience, I never have recurrence, almost never because we're very aggressive with the way we treat the post EMR margin. So we completely excise all tissue. You can't ablate any residual adenoma, but once you've excised everything, treat the margin, and then uh, the risk of recurrence is approaching zero. Um, there's a paper there uh, from gastroenterology. Um, uh, so here, another example. So after the learning curve, recurrence is very low. So here's an example of the technique. Um, so this is a lesion, I think in the left colon. So we take the, the nodular area first, very large portion, uh, with a large snare in the modern age, you don't need to be worried about perforation. It's, it's infrequent, but if it happens, you can easily fix it. You just have to recognize it. And then we work. Uh, sequentially from the point of first entry into the submucosal plane and just work along excise, excise. Um, uh, there's a small bit of residual adenoma at the edge. So when we identify that, we always take it immediately, take it with a large piece of normal tissue. Don't be worried about how much normal tissue you remove. Um, and then at the end, uh, see, this is probably a 20 millimeter snare, I suppose. So we generally use a, a 20 millimeter uh, snare in the left colon, 15 in the right. And then finally at the end here, um, I hope we're getting to the end. Um, there's the clean defect, no evidence of deep mural injury. You can see the muscle underneath. If we're worried, we can do this, what we call TSC. Uh, which is topical submucosal chromoendoscopy. So you just irrigate the surface with blue dye. And now we coagulate the margin. The key thing is to keep moving. Um, 80 watts effect four, you keep moving. That takes a minute or two. It's a handy technique to learn because it's a good stepping stone to learning ESD. The movements are similar, the side to side movements. Um, and you can employ the same technique, the same EMR technique at the anorectal junction. This was a study we just published in gut, I think 120 cases at the ARJ versus the proximal rectum, 400 cases, outcomes the same. If the lesion is scarred, so say you can't uh, excise it by EMR, then you can do this uh, cast technique, cold avulsion followed by snare tip soft coagulation. So this works very well for, pre for previously attempted and non-lifting lesions. We published this paper recently in the American Journal of Gastro. Um, I think a hundred odd scarred lesions and once we fully excise, so here's an example, terrible, terrible. These are overrepresented in the rectum too, because uh, referring endoscopists feel they can keep having a crack at it because it's safe, but eventually they decide they can't get rid of it. And then it comes to us and we can excise it by EMR. And then for the scarred area, we do the cast technique. Um, this is a hole in the muscle, the circular layer that doesn't need anything done. Uh, and then we just do avulsion. So you can see here that recurrence, uh, this predates the snare tip technique. So recurrence is a bit higher. Um, uh, but uh, so once we excise, then we, then we take the forceps and um, remove the scarred tissue. So here's an example here. So um, EMR. Just go forward a little bit. Uh, okay, back here, I think. So here's the scarred, the central. So we've excised everything we can, and then you're left with this scarred central area. Now, because the tissue is freed up on either side, it just tears off so easily with the biopsy forcep. You just work systematically across, and then you treat the avulsion bed with snare tip soft coagulation. So we treat this with snare tip soft coagulation. And then because we've created a DMI type two, in other words, an area that we can't evaluate the submucosal plane, 
we just close it all up with clips. This is easily done as well. So we put the clips across the centre here and patient goes home same day, very, very safe. And then we treat the margin with snare tip as well. Um, uh, we can use the same technique for treating recurrence. Uh, this, this paper hasn't quite been published yet, but it's coming. Um, based on 2000 lesions, 200 cases of recurrence. And you can see same method. Um, I'll, I'll skip this video, but just to show there's, a, there's an extensive recurrence. And then at the end, we have this area. So we do the cold avulsion um, like so, and then the snare tip like so, and then treat the margin. So the end result looks quite elegant like so. Um, so what about rectal lesions? Then we have a stronger bias for using ESD. Um, I won't go into the cost effectiveness analysis, but just to say that if you do use ESD and you want to use ESD, um, then per thousand cases, it's about 43 ESDs you need to use, but particularly so in the rectum because the consequences of incompletely resecting a cancer or inadequately resecting uh, treating a, a cancer endoscopically are major with the risk of stoma and so forth. So if the lesion is at risk of uh, cancer, bearing in mind that cancer risk is twice that of the colon in the rectum for large lateral spreading lesions, then we have a bias towards ESD. So for overt um, submucosal invasive disease, here, here we see this is at least high grade dysplasia. You see this demarcated zone with disruption of pit and microvascular pattern. So we manage this by ESD. So we pretty much do two every Thursday morning. Um, and these are other examples. So we do lots of ESD. This is an example here, not as much as Yataka, but still quite a lot. Um, and a lot in the upper GI, lots of it in the upper GI. So here, this is cancer. Um, so uh, this needs to be removed by ESD. Um, Yutaka will talk more about this, but, um, and then you see the end result. Uh, it also has a very important role even for deep cancer in the comorbid. So older people who cannot have surgery, we would excise this by ESD. There are also patients who are stoma resistant. This fellow could have had uh, an APR, um, but he refused to have surgery. So we excise this uh, deeply invasive cancer. We recognize that it's probably going into the muscle layer. So we take the inner circular and leave the longitudinal. So we can do an intermuscular dissection here. Um, uh, like so. So um, you'll see here at this point, we see that the tumor is heading down into the muscle layer. So we take the circular layer, but leave the longitudinal layer um, like so. And you see here the end result um, here circular layer is gone, the longitudinal layer remains. Here's, here's the plane where we entered the, um, the intermuscular dissection. So um, that's overt cancer. What about covert? No doubt some lesions are at risk uh, for containing cancer that can't be seen. These are basically the bulky uh, nodular lesions that you see in the rectum. The risk is between 10 and 20%. We've shown recently, this has just been published in CGH, that flat lesions, the sensitivity for detecting cancer is very good. So I like to use the Latin analogy, the food analogy. So if you're looking at a pizza, you know what's in the pizza because it's all there before you. But if it's a calzone, if it's a nodular lesion, you can't tell uh, what's inside. So for flat lesions, if you carefully interrogate, you don't miss cancer. The risk is something like six in a thousand but for nodular lesions, the risk is much greater. Um, so, so if we see lesions at risk for covert, in other words, no visible cancer, but there is a risk of cancer because they're bulky, uh, nodular lesions, mixed nodular lesions, rectum and sigmoid, then we manage these by ESD like so. Um, and we have a study going addressing this rectum specific uh, resection algorithm. 
Um, so in this patient, for example, uh, same day, two lesions, flat granular lesion, no risk of cancer in that one. We can do that by EMR and snare tip. And then uh, adjacent to that bulky nodular lesion, we do that by ESD um, same day. Um, here again, large lesion, nodular component. So we do ESD. Um, and this is what we recommended in the guideline uh, that I was fortunate to publish on with uh, these other guys, Horst and, and Jacques, on the role of ESD in Western endoscopy. Uh, you can see that ESD has a huge role in the upper GI and certainly in the left colon and rectum. And very extensive bulky lesions, for example, this 18 centimeter mixed nodular lesion rectum can be done uh, by ESD. So here we see the squamous margin, which tore off when we were removing the lesion, the anal canal, and the whole of the rectum excised by ESD. Uh, we can do it by tunneling as well, um, circumferential lesion excised by ESD in the proximal rectum, and multiply recurrent lesions uh, if there's risk for cancer, also managed by ESD, in this case also inter intermuscular dissection. And stenosis, not such a big problem, but can be managed by, um, uh, by the patient themselves. So this idea of the rectum-specific resection algorithm, um, I won't go into it. We're just about to um, publish the paper. Um, so in summary, uh, flat, in flat lesions, optical detection of SMIC has high sensitivity and can reliably guide treatment decisions. EMR, I think, is the safest, most efficient and effective method to treat most large uh, colonic lesions, um, excluding the rectum. Uh, recurrence should be infrequent in the era of uh, margin thermal ablation. Uh, and scarred lesions, any sort of lesion, if it's benign, is easily treated by EMR or adjuvant techniques, uh, including cast. Um, and the rectum is different to the colon. Um, only flat lesions are without overt concern for cancer should be treated by EMR. The remainder require consideration of ESD and they need to be managed in specialized centers. Um, uh, and the absence of optical evidence for deep MSMIC um, uh, means that complete endoscopic resection uh, by ESD provides definitive T staging and is the first step for most benign lesions, overtly benign or not obviously deeply invasive lesions because all options still remain on the table. You have the full tumor out and then you can decide what to do. Patient can still have surgery, radiotherapy, whatever. Uh, and of course we can offer a more aggressive ESD for those who are elderly, comorbid or otherwise. So um, thank you very much for this opportunity to give this uh, lecture. Um, uh, uh, thank you. Bueno, eh, muchísimas gracias, doctor Berg. Eh, no sé cómo se encuentra con tiempo para contestar alguna pregunta o lo dejamos libre. Yes, yes, for sure. Bueno, eh, yo le quería hacer una pregunta. Eh, está muy, muy clara la, la presentación, eh, pero hemos visto que hay lesiones. Eh, que con características semiológicas muy parecidas, en las cuales uno realiza una resección endoscópica de la mucosa y otras veces una disección eh, de la mucosa. Eh, ¿Cuál sería el parámetro que usted utiliza para definir entre una u otra técnica? Yeah, so um, pretty much everywhere we do EMD or EMR, um, but in the rectum. Um, and um, to some extent in the sigmoid, if we, sus if, if we suspect uh, there's a risk for covert cancer, in other words, a bulky lesion, mixed nodular lesion, then we err on the side of doing ESD because we don't want to find cancer in a piecemeal resection uh, because that means the patient has to have surgery and the morbidity of the surgery in the rectum and uh, left colon is much, much greater than that in the right colon. It's really quite uncommon that we find cancer uh, in a large lesion in the right colon. Uh, covert cancer in the right colon is not, not, not very common. Um, I, I think you understand the, the concept of this, this idea of covert. In other words, something that we, you know, we can't see the cancer. 
Um, Bien, muchas gracias. Y otra pregunta un poco relacionada, cuando realiza una técnica de CAST, cuando, cuando llega al sector que se encuentra firme, fibroso, en el centro de la lesión, eh, previo a realizar una electrofulguración de esa zona, ¿toma una muestra de biopsia o la da, la, de, la da por perdida y la electrofulgura? Yeah, uh, good question. So I... I apologize if I didn't make that completely clear. With the biopsy faucet, when you approach the scarred area, you still have some residual adenoma. It might be, you know, five millimeter, 10 millimeter, sometimes even as much as 15 to 20 millimeter of scarred residual adenoma. Usually it's not so much, maybe five or eight millimeter. We use the biopsy faucet with the serrated jaw to avulse that tissue. So we, because the tissue is freed up on, on the edge, it's only attached underneath. So when you pull it off with the biopsy force, it, it tears off very easily. So that's cold avulsion. Um, Doug Rex and Greg Haber uh, pioneered the technique of hot avulsion. They use an electrosurgical current to avulse. We just use cold avulsion. The tissue tears off very easily. We send it for histopathology. And only when we've removed all the tissue, which is surprisingly easy because it's not attached laterally, just underneath. So it tears off in large pieces. Then we have a bland defect that's oozing a bit, oozing a bit of blood, but no visible residual adenoma. Then we do electrofulguration, but we use a specific current, which is soft coagulation. And so it's, it's on an Irby generator, it's 80 watts effect four. It's, it's uh, the technique and the settings are uh, described extensively in all our papers. And you can just use the snare tip to coagulate the surface. We start with the bleeding point, stop the bleeding, usually, the, and, and then just treat the rest of it. You can be quite aggressive and just uh, completely coagulate the avulsion bed. And, and that uh, is the end of it. Then you generally, we clip it up just in case of the risk, small risk of delayed perforation. To avoid that. Perfecto. Eh, una cosita más. Y esa biopsia que toma la manda en forma diferenciada con el resto de la lesión o la manda todo junto. Yeah, we do. We send it uh, separately. Uh, we just call it central scarred area, but we never find we never find cancer in it. Um, Uh, we can tell, you know, with the pit pat and everything, if there's cancer or not. So we just send it separately. And um, also that EMR example I showed, the big nodular component, if we remove that by EMR, we submit that separately as well. Um, to be honest, in the right colon, we don't find cancer in those big specimens either. So we break up the pathology as necessary. Um, but if there's an area that we're concerned about, we definitely submit that separately. Gracias. Última pregunta del doctor Palermo. Me pregunta si las resecciones en retroflexión del recto las realiza con un colonoscopio o un gastroscopio, que es más flexible. Yeah, so if we're doing ESD, we, we always use the gastroscope, of course. Um, and um, uh, if we're... Uh, And, but if we're doing EMR, then we use a colonoscope. Um, but if, there's, if, if ever there's difficulty, we, we have the option to change scope. So if you have a problem with access or small spaces, angles, you can always switch to a gastroscope. Um, but generally for ESD, we use a gastroscope. And then for EMR, we generally use a colonoscope because we like the six o'clock working channel being able to push down firmly on the cushion uh, with the up-down wheel. Bueno, muchísimas gracias. Sandra o Emiliano, ¿quieren hacerle alguna pregunta al doctor? Si no, lo dejamos libre. Sí, yo quería preguntarle al doctor Burke si está utilizando eh, la resección bajo agua para las recidivas. Um, yeah, uh, we probably need to do a randomized trial. I, I think it's a good idea and it looks attractive when I see it Um, uh, you know, when Ken demonstrates it at the various meetings. So um, 
I, that's probably one area of EMR that we haven't, that, you know, our group has not sufficiently explored. So we're looking at that to increase our, our presence in the underwater area, aqua, Aquaman style, you know. Amy? Bueno, muchísimas gracias, eh, Dr. Bohr. Lo dejamos libre. Muchísimas gracias por su participación. Okay. La verdad que lo agradecemos infinitamente. Muchas gracias. Bueno, good evening. Enjoy. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bueno, Sandri, ya podemos presentar al siguiente speaker. Sí. ¿Eh? Bueno, eh, el webinar continúa con, con otra eminencia a nivel mundial. ¿sí? Eh, nos va a dar una, una charla el profesor Saito. El doctor Saito es el jefe de la división endoscopía del Hospital del Centro Nacional de Cáncer de Tokio, en Japón. Es experto en disección submucosa endoscópica, especialmente en colon. Es uno de los pioneros en esta técnica. Ha desarrollado incluso eh, muchos de los accesorios que se usan, como el IT Knife, es un, es, un, es un colega muy reconocido mundialmente, eh, ha participado como operador y como speaker en incontables este, congresos en, en todo el mundo, ha publicado más de 300 artículos y es autor de varios libros también de la especialidad. En esta oportunidad obviamente nos va a hablar de, de, de la resección submucosa endoscópica en colon, cómo hacerla y hasta dónde extenderla. Así que, y en el caso personal, es un orgullo presentarlo ya que fue mi mi tutor allá en Japón y quien me enseñó a usar un colonoscopio. Sensei Saito, este, muy bienvenido y esperamos aprender mucho de su charla. No sé why for this presentation. Uh, the debate on PCM DMR and ESD still continues outside Japan or already stopped. Uh, we reported some invasive recurrences after PCM DMR in surgical endoscopy. But is there no invasive recurrence after peace media EMR in the West, especially in a long term follow up, more than three or five years? Uh, similar invasive recurrence cases were reported from the West. Dr. Mehta and Amit Bat from Cleveland Clinic. Oh, uh, yes, recurrence occurred after peace media EMR when we surveyed the patient for long term. Uh, in their case series, malignant recurrence occurred in six cases out of 229 patients. The incidence was 2.6%. The uh, incidence is similar to our case series. And they concluded, when expertise is available, embryo section techniques such as ESD should be the goal. Uh, guidelines for correct EMR, ESD in US, ESGE, and Japan. Uh, currently, only JGS guidelines recommend the ESD for specific correctal tumors. JGS guidelines published in Digestive Endoscopy, the official journal of the JGS and WEO. Uh, ESD indication is simple, intramucosal, or SM slight cancer for which embryo EMR is difficult to apply. In this diagnosis, magnified NBI and PIT pattern is essential. And good news for the West, the clinical practice update has published in CGH by Peter and Norio. Uh, the guideline is almost the same as ours, but we should be a little careful about some points. One, uh, ESD indication is not for SM deep invasion, but SM slight invasion. In other words, uh, if SM1 is the target of ESD, it is difficult to diagnose unless intermucosal cancer or high grade dysplasia in the West should also be included in the target of ESD. And the indication of RS location was probably derived from the result of ACE study read by Professor Michael Brown. But this will have some selection bias. Since the ACE study included on the EMR cases, it, it is highly likely that many patients with suspected SM in the light column operated and those with suspected SM in the lectum only were treated by EMR. This is a paper published in Endoscopy from our group. 
in order to clarify the SM invasion risk, uh, we need to include not only EMR, ESP, but also surgery cases. <clears throat> Uh, this is a newly analyzed data from our endoscopy reported data. As shown, there was no difference in SM invasion rate between colon and rectum when we include the surgery cases as well. Now, I'd like to show some ESD cases. And the, the cancer also exists not only in the rectum, but also in the light colon. I don't know why the Professor Michael Bau uh, doesn't see any cancer in the colon compared to rectum. But this is a LST non-granular type, pseudo depthless type in the hepatic fracture. Uh, magnified NVI reveals the irregular vest and irregular surface pattern, genet type 2B. And for the genet type, to be region, the chromoscopy, not only in the current, but crystal vital staining is essential for choosing the strategy. And in this case, the, the patient from, uh, came from Hong Kong. And uh, in Hong Kong, the biopsy result revealed carcinoma, and the surgery was planned, and blocking tattooing was applied for the region. But the patient uh, came to our National Cancer Center. This is the lead uh, located in the hepatic fracture, the LST, non-granular type, pseudo depressed type. The center is depressed, looks like cancer. But in this case, magnified NBI and PIT pattern show the genet type 2B and 5Y uh, low irregular, non-invasive PIT pattern. So good indication for ESD. For this kind of region, especially should the type are really difficult to be treated by Embroc EMR showing the non-lifting sign. Now in this case, we are starting the ESD using retroflex of the scope. The reason for retroflexion is we could approach to the some causal dissection line horizontally, and also we could uh, stable the scope using this retroflex. First, we injecting the glycerol to confirm good some causal uh, elevation, and then we inject a uh, <clears throat> hyaluronic acid solution or lifter K, the viscous solution. If we try to inject the viscous solution from the beginning, so there is some risk of injection into the muscle layer or sub serosal layer because the mass layer is very thin in the colorectum, especially in the proximal colon. And the tips for e colon ESD is don't perform circumferential incision, just partial marginal incision, and then immediate some causal dissection is essential. Uh, it is why uh, in the colorectum, even using viscous solution, the SM elevation disappear quickly. That's why we don't conduct the circumferential incision, just partial marginal incision and immediate submucosal dissection. And we could inject the glycerol through the jet B knife immediately. And then gentle pressure for the submucosal layer using a short type SD food, we could visualize the cutting line directly. It is really important to use the appropriate devices for safer colon ESD. In this case, the tumor size is around four centimeter. And now, after completing the submucosal dissection to some extent, we are changing the device to IT knife nano. This is specially designed for chronic and esophageal ESD. And uh, the advantage of IT nano is a very strong effect of coagulation. Even for this kind of the massive bleeding, we could coagulate the bleeding without using coagulasp. And this is a straightforward view. 
and using IT nano, we are uh, performing the some causal dissection like this. And even for the thick vessel, we could uh, dissect uh, with coagulating the vessels. No, oh, thank you. <clears throat> And at this moment, almost the uh, oral site is uh, completely dissected. Now we are continuing some causal dissection. Now we could see the region, the left side, and the right side is a mass layer. So it's important to dissect lower side some causal layer. Uh, in case of some causal invasion that happened to visualize during the ESD, so we could dissect below the tumor under direct visualization. Now this is uh, again the letter of exposition. We are completing the circumferential incision using IT knife nano, and then uh, visualize the cutting line using the short type ST food effectively and set to the IT knife the edge of the dissection line and then move the knife along the uh, coronic wall so to find the edge and to fix the IT knife nano and then move the scope along the coronic wall. Uh, this is a little flex position again. So the six o'clock is a muscle layer and the 12 o'clock is a tumor. Now this is almost the final dissection part. Now we are finalizing the dissection using little flex position. In this case, the Ambrook dissection completed uh, in one hour without complications. In this case, the region located very close to the lots of the vertical. Now you can see the uh, the vertical here and here, and taking anticoagulant coagulant agent. So uh, we are trying to close the defect. So using a clip and nylon technique, we could completely close this kind of large defect. Now that we are applying clip with nylon line from the biopsy channel, and catch the normal mucosa, including muscle layer. And then applying another clip. And catch the nylon line, and then grab the opposite side uh, normal mucosa including some causal layer and gently applying five years clip. And I'm putting the nylon line outside of the scope and then a defect become shrinking. And we are applying the same procedure again and again. Same procedure again and again, and completely close the defect. And this region, diagnosed histologically, well to moderately differentiated adenocarcinoma. The interim causal curative section was achieved. And Yes, the short-term outcome was getting better and better even recently, even in our Japanese mal center group. The Ambrook resection rate uh, increased from 88% to 97%. Uh, the procedure time also decreasing 
the perforation rate also decreased from 5% to 2.5%. <clears throat> Today, the perforation rate is 1% or less. And Dr. Harader presented our recent multi center ESD long term outcome during the DDW 2021. 20 high volume centers uh, nationwide participated in this study. The case registration period was from February 2013 to January 2015. The study protocol is as shown. The old patient who was scheduled correctly ESD enrolled. And actually ESD was performed on uh, 1,883 patients. The surveillance was conducted by colonoscopy and the survival survey and scheduled at one year, three year, and five years after CESD. We investigated 1,493 patients who underwent follow up colonoscopy at least once within four years. This is the one of the key slides. We examined the incidence of metachronous cancer advanced neoplasia as well as local recurrence in this study. Regarding recurrence rate after CESD, the local recurrence was just 0.3% of the patients, but the newly developed carcinomas in sites unrelated to ESD were found in no less than 1.8%. Uh, surveillance colonoscopy, within four years after CESD should we pay attention to metachronous corrector neoplasia rather than local recurrence. And congratulations for the excellent paper from US Mars Center ESD cohort. Uh, in this paper, a total of 211 corrector ESD has been conducted and the excellent outcomes are reported. 86% envelope dissection rate 83% R0 resection rate, 4.7% perforation, and no emergency surgery conducted. And recently, our paper, the cost effective analysis of EMR and ESD uh, using the Markov model uh, analysis that published in Digestive Endoscopy. Uh, this study, including the long term outcome and including the patient QOL, ESD is um, sought as cost effectiveness for correct EMR. Please enjoy this publication. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, ESD will widespread widely even outside Japan due to the development of various traction devices and dissemination of ESD knives with injection function. The recently Boston Scientific uh, launched the Pro knife. Uh, that is uh, really nice with high injection uh, solution. A new technology has made overwhelming progress in the world. Uh, thank you very much. Bueno, muchísimas gracias, doctor Saito. Una excelente presentación. Eh, yo tengo una pregunta para hacerle. No sé si me escucha. Sí. Yes. Eh, por lo menos en Occidente hay, se, se ha puesto mucho énfasis en cerrar la brecha de los sitios de resección. Eh, yo recuerdo que la técnica que usted hacía eh, no ponía tanto énfasis en cerrar esos, esos lechos, y actualmente veo que sí este, lo hace. Quería preguntarles en qué caso usted considera conveniente cerrar el sitio de resección en el colon. Con clips desde ya. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, it's a really nice question. Uh, considering the uh, incidence of delayed breathing or delayed perforation, the, it is not necessary to close all. ESD defect, uh, but only for the selected patient, the, such as the high risk for breeding, the taking uh, anticoagulant uh, drugs, or in case of some muscle injury, 
uh, during the ESD procedure. So we, we uh, will close the defect using this uh, clip nylon technique. This will uh, <coughs> reduce the risk of delayed bleeding even in uh, high risk patients. Perfecto. Eh, y otra pregunta cortita. Eh, ¿Usted ha cambiado su técnica eh, original de resección? Eh, ¿Utiliza la, las técnicas nuevas desarrolladas más en Occidente, ¿no? como el pocket ESD o la tunelización, donde a nosotros los, los endoscopistas occidentales, que no somos tan diestros como los de Oriente, nos permiten este, fijar mejor el endoscopio? ¿Usted se ha servido de esas técnicas para, para algún tipo de, de resección? Ah, oh, thank you very much. The pocket creation method is uh, not a Western technique. The Japanese colleague, Professor Yamamoto's group, uh, developed. And also the pocket creation method or tunneling method is a really nice uh, technique, the, especially for the large one. Uh, yes, we uh, recently are using such kind of the uh, uh, tunneling or pocket creation mes uh, method for the difficult one. And even using the conventional method, the recent advantage is that uh, we could use the various traction methods, such as uh, clip nylon traction or SO clip, and the March uh, traction uh, loop from Boston Scientific is also commercially available. Uh, such kind of traction is uh, really help the easier and effective ESD. Muchas gracias. Gonzalo, Sandra, ¿quieren hacer alguna pregunta? Del público no hay ninguna todavía. Eh, ¿Qué volumen de ESD se necesita para lograr una curva de aprendizaje? Oh, it's a, a really important question. So, the, from our previously the published data in GIE, the Marsh Center Corrector ESD Uh, case series. Uh, in the uh, paper, when the uh, experience of corrector ESD, uh, the number is less than 50 cases, the complication rate was high. So at least 50, but uh, I think at least uh, uh, 100 ESD uh, should be the uh, minimum requirement for the better ESD quality, at least 100. But the uh, Another point is uh, maybe you can train not from human. Recently, you could use the very nice the animal model training system. So we do recommend to, to do the such kind of uh, training using the animal model before starting the human ESD. And the, uh, another important thing is maybe it's better to start from the easier case. In Japan, the trainee doctors start from gastric ESD, especially in the antrum. And uh, I know the in the Western countries, the incidence of early gastric cancer is uh, very limited. So in such case, you could start from the lower rectum. The, and uh, you can start from not so huge region, maybe uh, start from three centimeter or less. So step by step is really important. Perfecto. Gonzalo, ¿alguna pregunta? Activa el audio, Gonzalo. Bueno, no, esta pregunta es medio difícil de formular. Uno ve en los trabajos que se tabulan eh, un número de ISD, pero ¿qué pasa con esos casos en que en mitad del procedimiento, por algún tipo de imprevisto, eh, no, no ocurre, no se puede seguir con una técnica y esa lesión pasa a ser una resección en partes, una técnica híbrida? ¿Cómo se tendría que llamar o solucionar ese, eh, o tabular esos casos? Oh, uh, so our multi-center uh, study, such kind of cases, 
uh, if we uh, change to the hybrid one, uh, maybe uh, it's better uh, to differentiate it from the uh, pure ESD. Now, JGS guideline now uh, have the definition. The complete ESD is the <clears throat> envelope resection completed using the ESD technique. And the hybrid ESD is defined using some dissection and finally using the snare for the resection is defined as hybrid ESD. And the pre-cutting EMR is defined as no dissection, just marginal resection and the snaring is defined as uh, pre-cutting EMR in the JJS guideline. And uh, we also published some uh, one paper and uh, some other colleagues also published the limitation for the hybrid ESD technique is the tumor size uh, limitation. Maybe the maximum size is up to three centimeter in diameter. Uh, that is the limitation for hybrid ESD technique. So if we try to do Embryo dissection for the larger regions, more than four or more than five centimeter. So the uh, complete ESD uh, will be necessary. But uh, my another uh, point. Bueno, hay una pregunta de... For the Western endoscopy sí, is my hybrid ESD could be the bridge between EMR and the ESD until you are you feel confident with your ESD technique. Uh, so maybe that in this uh, scenario, also the step-by-step -step technique will be uh, fine for the ESD beginner. The first uh, continuous ESD until the uh, safe area. And uh, in the last, maybe you could apply the snaring. You can shorten the ESD procedure time and also maybe the risk of perforation will decrease. Eh, acá hay una pregunta, hay una pregunta de, de, de la audiencia, eh, doctor Saito, eh, nos preguntan si eh, usted realiza previo a la recepción la tinción de las lesiones y si la hace con qué. Eh, Esa es la pregunta del público y la mía personal es si ha dejado de utilizar este, la cromoendoscopía vital y solo la hace digital o sigue usando cromoendoscopía vital. Oh, that's a uh, really uh, nice question. Unfortunately, we are still using the uh, cromoendoscopy using endocarmine or crystal violet staining. Uh, that is, the, we are using the JNET classification, that is a magnified NBI classification, but the limitation for the JNET is JNET type 2B, the diagnostic accuracy is not perfect. Uh, so, and for the cancer depth uh, diagnosis, the, we also reported the pit pattern using crystal violet staining showing the high diagnostic accuracy compared to uh, magnified NBI. So we could uh, also reduce the number of the real chromoscopy, but when we suspect carcinoma by uh, NBI, uh, especially for the JNET type 2B, we still use the crystal bite staining for the more accurate uh, uh, diagnosis. Perfecto, gracias. Hay una pregunta del doctor Murature. ¿Qué modelos utilizan en Japón para el entrenamiento en ESD? Uh, training models. Uh -huh. uh, our uh, junior doctors use the isolated pig stomach for the ESD training. Uh, it's the most common. Uh, training model. And uh, recently, there are some another uh, easy to use training model, such as endogel. It's an artificial uh, tissue for the ESD. So uh, we can use it uh, at any time, but the cost is a little bit expensive. 
So the most costless and also easy to use is by using the isolated pig stomach. And uh, of course, you need uh, some box uh, like this, uh, but it's really similar to uh, human ESD. And you can train your ESD technique using such kind of the animal, uh, uh, animal model, not living. They're just isolated big stomach is the, the best one. Perfecto. Otra pregunta de la, de la audiencia, doctor Saito, es si considera en algún caso eh, realizar la resección eh, endoscópica directamente en quirófano por si eventualmente se requiere algún abordaje laparoscópico quirúrgico. Oh, so uh, the, we also report, reported in GI endoscopy and uh, uh, how to uh, case match control study of the colonic perforation during VSD. And in the case series, uh, 95, 98% perforation could be uh, treated conservatively using endoclips because the perforation occurred during the chronic VSD is usually very small. So we could close the defect uh, effectively. So the emergency surgery rate is the 0.1%. It's very low. But of course, uh, when the delayed perforation occurs, the incidence is of 0.0%. So we need a uh, laparoscopic surgery. In such case, so, we need a patient <clears throat> go to uh, operation theater for uh, laparoscopic surgery. And uh, another scenario is even we, uh, we diagnose every ESD candidate by image and stendoscopy, pit pattern, magnified NBI. But finally, the non curative resection due to the submucosal deep invasion or lymphovascular invasion uh, was uh, around 10%. So the, after the endoscopic uh, resection, the such kind of non-curative histology uh, revealed, we recommend the laparoscopic surgery with lymph node dissection. Perfecto. Sandri, me decías que hay una última pregunta del público. Del público, sí. sí. Que en Occidente hay en lugares donde no cuentan con magnificación para utilizar la clasificación Ginette, y que eh, le parece a usted utilizar la clasificación NICE para tomar eh, decisiones. Uh, Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, the limitation, nice classification mm. is, uh, yeah, somewhat nice for the differential diagnosis between benign and ne non-neoplastic and neoplastic. But the limitation for nice, nice too, including various regions from adenoma, interim causal cancer, SM invasive cancer. So for the uh, treatment decision, between EMR or Embroc PSD or surgery, uh, JNET classification is essential, I believe. But uh, even if you don't have the optical zoom uh, in the West, now the Olympus is now launching the commercially available near, near focus system with high definition and also Fujifilm Medical is also selling the optical zoom endoscopy outside of Japan. So I do recommend to use such kind of the image and endoscopy with a near focus or optical zoom uh, for the treatment decision between EMR or ESD or surgery. We believe the zoom endoscopy is really clinically essential.
terminamos, Kemi? Bueno, sí, en honor al tiempo, el doctor Saito también tiene que volver a sus actividades habituales, así que por ahora no vamos a hacer más preguntas, y solo resta agradecerle, profesor Saito, este, por haber estado con nosotros. Muchísimas gracias, doctor Saito, por Thank su participación. Thank you. Thank you. Bueno, damos por finalizado nuestro seminario sí. web y nos vemos en el próximo. Muchísimas gracias a todos. Hasta luego. Gracias a todos. Buenas noches, gracias a todos.